Um, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Ilya. Oh, uh, should I wear a microphone? Or oh, no, I just talk loud. Yes. And everybody just talks loud. Okay. Is it Zoom? Is it a Zoom talk? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Um, oh, uh, he'll watch the chat. So I can change slides with this, can I? Can uh, I? Oh, it's like that. I see. Okay. What was that? You want to wait? I should wait. I'm not going to wait. Um, okay. So uh, my name is Jonathan Weintraub, and I am uh, uh, chairing the session. Um, on behalf of Lindy Blackburn, and, and I know Lindy is on the Zoom, um, and maybe he could have chaired the session by Zoom, um, but, but um, Lindy, uh, we're glad you're here, and uh, we're, we're, we're sorry you can't be here in person, and um, I'm going to do my best to, uh, to stand in for you. Um, the session is, uh, is called uh, Instrumentation. And and something else. Software part two. Instrumentation and software part two. Um, and I'm, in fact, I had a, uh, it, it, yeah, I, I remember the, the order of the presentations uh, more or less. There are four presentations, um, and mine was scheduled third, but I'm going to go first. Okay. And um, then what will happen is I'll hand over to, um, um, to the DSP team that's in front there, um, Ranjani and her and her colleagues, um, and uh, um, and and they are gonna they have two slots, one on uh, hardware and one on firmware, and those slots are a little bit redundant actually to what was presented in February this morning. So they've come up with an alternate uh, with sort of a fo some focus topics related to utilization and um, part selection. And then we'll close with um, a, a, a more structured talk on Hops by Dan Hoke, okay? And uh, my topic is, um, you know, there are the science working groups in NGEHT and there are also technical working groups in NGEHT. Um, and actually, Ranjani, will you tell me when it is, when it is quarter two? Oh. Okay, I'll try to keep this down to eight minutes and then I'll give you guys your, your, uh, your 30 minutes and then you'll get 15 including questions, okay? Um, so there are these uh, science working groups. There's, uh, you know, quite a lot of those, um, eight, I believe. And then there are three technical working groups. And you heard some presentations in plenary from the data management working group um, and, um, and also from the receiver working group. Or you heard presentations on receivers, at least from, uh, from Gopal. And um, I uh, am coordinating with um, Alan Loy, something called the Digital Backend Working Group. And I'm going to give, just give you a flavor for what that working group is doing. Um, and, and one of the key points here is that the Digital Backend Working Group is not designing an instrument. It's just looking at what's available in the world in general, trying to extract what technologies are out there, trying to extract what developments are out there, trying to come up with design considerations, top level requirements that might go into a digital backend working group. And actually a, a very conscious part of its remit is to try to engage with the community, the, the global community broadly. And so um, I reached out to a bunch of people, um, uh, uh, Ariel and, and, and Ranjani are part of the group. But we also have representatives from Australia, um, in, including uh, Matt um, Bales and Adam Della, um, John Ford from the University of Arizona, who was a very good Casper guy, Guillermo, Guillermo, Guillermo Ganchio. He is the root of this collaboration with the Argentinians since he came to the Casper workshop in 2019. Heno Creel from Sorau, who's an excellent engineer. Um, Ganesh also in the room, uh, representing analog uh, lockdown converter. Although we're doing DSPs, we are including the lockdown converter in our remit. We are not including the re recorder, actually. Shep, in his introductory presentation, slightly misstated that recorder comes under the um, data management working group. 
which which is being coordinated by by Mark and and, and Lindy, um, you know, etc. Um, Yajun Wu uh, was recommended by uh, Eric Shen of the uh, Shanghai Astronomical Observatory. We have a charter, which is a multi-page document, but this is the Precy. And uh, basically what we're doing is coming down up with considerations for top level requirements, not the top level requirements, but the kinds of things that one might consider when writing them. Um, and looking at the world in general and seeing what's out there in the way of technology, um, ongoing projects, and what, what, what other considerations should we consider for the project. Um, going back to the members of the group, um, the way we ran in practice was to have meetings, not as frequent as some other working groups. They were kind of periodic every month or two months. And for each meeting, we would schedule some specialist presentation by a particular expert. And so uh, uh, actually in the early days, um, I think when I gave my presentation on the quad 16 gig sample per second A to D, Ranjani was not yet on the working group. I invited you later. Um, uh, but when it came time to present on block down converters, Ranjani and Ganesh presented on that together with my colleague, John Test, who's not directly on the working group, but he's a great uh, IFLO engineer. Sorry, I'll go back to that. Um, and then there's this thing called the DBBC4, and Alan Roy is on the DBBC4 team, and he gave us a bit of a status update on that, um, interacting with Gino Takari, who um, is the leader of the DBBC4 team, um, uh, channelization considerations um, was presented by Adam, Adam Della, uh, that's, and that's going to come up um, when Ranjani and a, and a group talk about uh, utilize, about channelization and the, the impact on utilization and part selection. Um, and Adam, of course, is one of the global experts on DIFFEX, the original author of it, and so he can speak very much to the impact of channelization on correlatability of data. And um, uh, we, we also had a presentation on a fast A to D converter from Sorrel. They don't actually run as fast as our A to D converters, but they are really good at system engineering, packaging, um, thermal considerations, um, RFI, uh, EMI, RFI mitigation, and so forth. So anyway, um, framing the discussion is, the uh, old tech, which is dual five gig sample per second A to B converters, feed, feeding a vertex six FPGA, and eight 10 gigabit per second Ethernet ports coming out the back. And, and that is the basis of the RTBBE. It's Casper shared technology, the Roach 2. It works really well uh, without really breaking it down. That dotted line is um, slope 0.88, and, and the blue points are showing that we're getting correlations of data recorded by the digital backend that lie on the 0.88 line so that the digital efficiency is not being substantially impacted by um, the A to D conversions. And um, I'm flashing through this because Ranjani presented it this morning and Ranjani may show it again or is well equipped to present to it, Ranjani and her team. Um, and it may not also be the very latest data but it was one of the presentations that was given on the quad 16 gigasample per second A to D board. So this was an extract from the presentation I gave, way less contemporary to what Ranjani and group presented this morning. Um, there is work going on, a very interesting area of RF SOC, right? Uh, FPGAs that um, have built-in A to D converters that actually only run in present technology at um, four gigasamples per second, but have many bits, eight bits, I believe. And uh, Arash, uh, Dan Maroney, and David, um, David, who's love, David Forbes, um, are developing uh, Arash primarily an interleaved RF SOC, which can do eight bits. And, and run at eight gigasamples per second or perhaps even targeting 16. Um, 
the DBBC4. Um, I, I think what I would, I guess I can point, or maybe I can't, but it doesn't really matter. What I will, what I will point to here is that, is that the DBBC4 on paper has extraordinary specifications, either dual 56 gigasamples per second, or four channels at 28 gigasamples per second, um, with uh, I believe six bits of sampling, possibly eight. Um, Mark, you can correct me. But it's not it's not four bits, it's more than four no, bits. Six or eight. Six. six. Okay. If we could get one of these, it would do everything we hope to do, we think, with um the quad 16 gigas of the second A to D, a bit better perhaps because of the six bit uh, sampling. Um, but I can't get a quote for price or delivery, and the A to D is interleaved. Uh, Ranjani is telling me my time is up. Um, two more slides. A deep dive into DBE channelization. Why would we want to do it? I think this is the slide with the most substance in what I have to show. Um, the, 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 the first point is that um, we were wondering how whether we should channelize at all because the DBE doesn't channelize. And then given the decision to channelize, which I think we've made, we didn't know how much to channelize. And so, as part of this working group, although Adam Taylor didn't volunteer the information, I approached him and asked him to give a specialist presentation. And he came up with criteria. I mean, the first one you can do amplitude equalization across an eight figure band or a slope with a wide ripple. You can equalize before you truncate. Um, strong RF components, that one doesn't apply so much to our way of thing. Nonetheless, a consideration for digital backends. Um, the, the key one is the parallelization, an optimal channel width for parallelization and difference. Um, and you don't channelize too much because then you impact the correlation efficiency. Um, and uh, he talked quite a bit about oversampling of polyphase full events, where if you want to do a coarse and a fine channelization, you want to overlap them so you can. Uh, take off the wings and have brick wall responses so that when you find channelize you don't scalp any on the band edges. So this was Adam's particular expertise, and we were very grateful to have his input and expertise here. I'll, I'll just point out that when you form a technical working group, you're asking a bunch of engineers to work for free. And scientists love to work for free because they just have their scientific interests and they come and they join the group and they can science with you. And then you get a publication out of it. But engineers look at this a little bit differently. So that you know, people want to help, but people have limited time and people have too much in some budgets and they need to book their time in a certain way. And so there are some challenges keeping a, a global working group engaged. And I'm just going to close, close with that. Um, we did come up with mitigations. We do not have the, we can have a question or two, I suppose. I'm the chair, so <laughs> well, thank you for giving me the time, usually, more or less. Uh, any questions or comments? Yeah, yeah. yeah. thanks a lot. Uh, so, from all these different developments, which one do you think is the one that has more chance to be final decisions for different investments? Yeah, I think it's before the ones that are developing more in the US. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, so we, we, we try to have the same system everywhere, or we are happy again to have a different one. Yeah, How is yeah, it? yeah, yeah. Both, both those are two questions, and both of them are good. I would say that the visibility that I have and we have from our place in the United States suggests that the system Ranjit is working on has the most chance of turning into a real instrument at this point. And that's just based on, I don't have a capacity as to exactly where it's at. The, the um, system that from Arizona with the, with the RF SOC doesn't run fast enough. Okay. I mean, I think all Arash has done is he's interleaved two four gigasolvers per second AD converters. So he's getting eight gigasolvers per second. It's actually very important to have 1634 gigasamples per second because we do want the system to interoperate with 
096 take a sample per second current R to DBE, and you can do that very easily if it's a commensurate multiple. So I am not closed off at all to the DBDC4, but its availability, cost, and even performance is opaque to me. So I cannot depend on it in, in a context of an engineering project. Um, and I think we're all open to the use of DBDC4, as frustrating as it might be to set good work aside. Um, oh, I think that we would like to have a set of requirements for a, for a digital back end that are sufficiently robust that we can qualify in multiple different systems for deployment. Whether that's a good idea from a monitoring control perspective for one telescope is another matter. But we already, already inevitably have heterogeneity because NGEHT includes EHT. Okay. I'll take one more brief question if there is one. Oh, I yeah. have one comment. Yeah. Uh, the oh, oh, good. Okay. I'm not aware of it actually. So who who is the person involved? You know. Yeah, yeah. Is is that is that is that called like SKA type stuff? No. Of a box, okay. Um, I'm, I, I'll be interested in, in hearing that. And RF soft may progress to have faster A to D converters. Yeah, I think they're faster. Yeah, they've become faster, but they're still not fast enough. All right. So uh, as chair, um, I, I, I uh, just to follow up with. Uh, I, I thought you when you mentioned the RF soft problem, so do we need the Oh, okay, so um, it is possible to use interleaved analog to digital converters for radio astronomy. I know this to be the case because we built uh, the SMA's correlator swarm with an interleaved five gigasol per second AGD converter, which was in the Roach 2 that I showed. Having been through the pain of properly calibrating quad core interleaved analog to digital converters. We, we are pretty clear internally that we would prefer not to have to do that again. It, it introduces, first of all, it's difficult in the first place. You never get rid of all the issues. And then there's a question of spares. You know, if you have one, do you calibrate on a per part basis? If you substitute a spare part, how do you ensure that the correct calibration gets applied? How do you calibrate in situ? How often do you have to repeat? Do the parts age? Questions of that nature arise. The calibration model teaches again the sound. You have to do it and it's on. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I we're not closed off to it. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, I I'm going to hand over to technically to Ranjni and Emilia. I'm going to give them half an hour. Um, Dan Dan will take them. Well, I, I'll go to five uh, with, with permission. We started five minutes past the hour. I'll go to five minutes past the hour uh, or so. And I'll give you, you know, I think that's potential enough. Um, and Dan will wrap up with his, with his talk on, on, uh, on Hubs. Um, and, 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 and Ranjani, uh, um, I, I'm actually going to leave it to you to. Uh, Oh, uh, good. We'll give it to the speaker. So, this is this point of work. And this is for changing slides. Oh, because that's from the Could I do a quick quick to try now? This one on the Ah, this one. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, as, I, as John mentioned, uh, it was not an accident that we're here actually, because first we were supposed to present here and then we got shifted to the planning session, but people forgot to do it from this computer talk. So uh, we figured we would use this time to sort of uh, maybe do a discussion because we're actually building an instrument and it would be great to get more feedback and suggestions and all that. And we thought that we could also use this time to discuss. Uh, uh, the center of um, uh, discussing uh, uh, the, the FPG actual FPG part based on some of the, the what do I call them, the 
very uh, hard line requirements that we have on the site on the site of the SPGA we need to do based on the capitalization requirements, which John talked about. So um, I am going to sort of uh, maybe walk through a little bit of my earlier presentation with a similar focus. If you recall, I just moved through most of that stuff. So I would I was sort of uh, just think at this point and uh, maybe I will ask me questions right now and then when I collaborate with President Homer aspect which when we will talk about the uh, uh, the FDGA utilization term in a little bit more detail and therefore what part we have identified for them and we can have a discussion about that we can ask questions but initially I would uh, uh, like so this is similar it will look very similar to the presentation we had in the morning with some difference. So as uh, as I mentioned, this is a 15. Well, it's supposed to be a 15 meter sample per second HP. It actually I mean, it actually runs at 15.384. Uh, so I clock it at 15.384, and uh, surprisingly, it works. I tested it at both feet and both clocks, both clock rates, and it works perfectly. I can see I don't see any different responses because that was important to find out. Um, and so let me go to the system block diagram. I think this is pretty. Uh, self explanatory. I don't think there were any particular questions. One question that uh, we mentioned was that the 86 figures actually that is not a big problem because if you notice, um, each uh, so the 230, 345, and if the 86 figures, if you stick to the 86 figures, it would just be another set of uh, it would just be an identical, you know, uh, 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 chapter or first chapter. Sure. Top thing to it is from the but if you also need to be from the reporter, the main Oh, no, no. So that's the thing. As Donna pointed out, I'm not responsible for this. Please. So. I was um, okay to go on stage. Yeah, I know. So right now, I have a. We have, I actually have published a rise of questions with the main people on the campus that we have had sort of connected to it. And we're actually trying, I'm actually trying to test the data rate uh, uh, output from the DDB to the 100 people that switch. We're actually stuck on the license that violence has to provide us anyway. So uh, that part actually will not be a problem uh, in including another agent thing that part. So, uh, so this one is like I said, fairly straightforward and self explanatory. Um, so again, this was uh, this was saying the FMC connection that I was talking about, by the way, is underneath, it's sitting right here. And that, that is a connection which really is annoying and it, it's not a robust connection at all. So, uh, and this was just a test in the NPR test, by the way, that I mentioned. It actually done the noise source, one of the noise source because you have to put in not for those. So, although I saw a show a tone source, most of the ABC characterizations were done with the tone source, for example, the tone harmonic distortion, the spurious dynamic range. Uh, and the cyanide, the e not the all done to the tone source because it's characterized it as uh, it was an obviously automated model because the right one to do so it's all automated now. So for four channels, we can run through all of it um, in like no time at all. And they actually, by the way, for all these characterizations, if you notice, I mentioned that it's done at full scale loading. So because I don't want there to be any doubt that it's going not done in full scale, it was done a little bit lower than full scale, and then you can say, Oh, not reporting it for you, so do not always. So, this is done absolutely at full scale. And then, um, so this is from as I said, the people have seen this already. I don't know, I don't think people have any questions. As I said, this would have been nice to have a team of filter and, and look into it. So, however, I we do have four filters, so I have to finish with a few more, but um, I just finished a couple of the measurements, they were perfectly fine. Um, and as I said, they're offset slightly, but that's something to be expected. And uh, again, <laughs> excuse me, this is obviously down to the noise source at DC to uh, 8.192. Uh, it, it, it has a, the noise source obviously cut off in the second uh, of the market. So, um, so I had to actually buy my switch filters to create a proper noise source for this. So, um, let's see. Uh, so let me go back. So the, I'm going to stop at this point and just ask here. So I have all these metrics that characterize the ADC fairly comprehensively, and the data, and it's much better than what the data should say, the data should actually be But uh, if, if you have any questions at this point, I'll just take a break before the end. Can you go back to the black test point? Uh, which one? The one on the base? No. So here you have this 
So what are your thoughts on biology? Yeah, well, I know, I know. I'm, I'm already you know marketing, right? So uh, we've already uh uh about we already had him in the lab and I showed him all this and given him all all the same around the call all the board to uh for the junction the junction junction to board to the all those parameters that like four k and right even in the table correct here but the sound is here and uh we've got to look into what is the best uh uh Cooling. I thought you might have seen me uh, uh, make it cooling. He assured me, probably not. Uh, we might need to do. Uh, so he's looking into it. Yeah, after the round, not going to do some analysis. Right. right. No, but uh, he's going to do this and design it for me. So uh, the thing that actually I want to ask uh, somebody, I, I am going to design it or I'm going to specify that the design is the worst case. And I'm assuming that the worst case environment is going to be this. Right. Not an actual right. Not an actual right. Not an actual right. Not an actual Apex is in the higher altitude, right? So I thought I could be designing. Apex can definitely be a little bit problem. But you know, yeah, you have to design for something like 5,000. Okay, right. So, uh, okay. So I'm trying to. Yeah. And, and, you know, you need an environment for person yeah. that's able to be successful, but it's about now. Oh, we have, okay. So, all right. So, in the past, the seat type right here, I had a say, oh, yeah. We right now don't have a key battery but they assure me that in about six to eight months we will. So I'm hoping they do. <laughs> so they do. So um, um, the other thing, no, the other thing, which we had, I did cross talk between the AC channel. Um, I have tested it to first order. I don't, if I terminate all the three inputs and inject something into one at full scale and all those noise and tone, to first order, I don't notice any cross talk. For this particular board design. Now, remember, I mentioned that we are going to do an in house integrated board design. So I may actually spread them out a little bit more, just because that's the easiest thing you can do to minimize crosstalk. So, uh, right now, I think that even for this, I don't know if it's going to be crosstalk, but I haven't done it in a proper, sophisticated way where I basically go, well, we have, you know, we have uh, a bit stalling at random. How do you distinguish that from actual crosstalk? So um, I have to do kind of a more statistical uh, test on the cost of, but as I said, the first order it looks okay. Um, I'm happy with it. I don't want to do anything really, really off about this. So I don't think one is any continuing leakage. So, but we'll see. Um, okay, so moving on. Uh, okay, moving on to this. Uh, this is a this is a very run of the mill almost. Signal processing chain. I don't know if anybody has any uh, comments. One thing that I pointed me to, which I will, which I think would be of interest, is uh, of course I have a I have a, a band pass filter and a night was filter. This is uh, to reject the image and to reject the other, of course. But he wants typically it gives me 30 dB of stop band innovation. However, the nice thing uh, that Ganesh pointed me to was that uh, now they make these um, reflections as filters, and typically you don't want to catch these filters because it's a great time waste. But these will be reflectionless, reflectionless filters. Oh, sorry. Uh, they're not, they're, custom, they're not custom filters. Uh, you can get them from mini circuits, but I just wanted to get something in that range to create an even deeper uh, uh, generation. So I managed, uh, 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 so based on his advice, I managed to, uh, when we did the design review, I actually included this in the design to, to uh, get a deeper rejection. And the night waste, of course, I, I sat on the foot of my manufacturer's head to tell them, this is what I need. And I always try to fight with them to get me the specifications I wanted. So, um, I don't know if you have any questions as I mentioned. I plan to serve on the input stage and I plan to, of course, serve on the uh, do an open closed loop server for the input stage and open loop uh, automatic game control for the output stage so that I don't be able to optimally whenever, no matter what the telescope is doing, so whatever, whatever it's focused. Yeah. Uh, hard to do at these high frequencies. So I think that the first set got blistered apparently, and I thought, okay. The second one, so the, the second batch, something else happened. So it's going to be delayed by a few weeks. But uh, they, they, they have promised me X microwave, the company which is putting this together, has a. a oh, something happened. 
But there promised me that there will never that uh, Lego block thing that I showed you with full uh, transfer function characterization and all that stuff. They will send me. And of course, I'm going to look at it again just to make sure that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Four to twelve. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yes. So it takes in four to twelve. Sorry, it takes in four to twelve receiver IF, and you get DC to eight or eight point one nine two. I'm just playing around just for the long time. It's actually eight point one nine two, which is the And that's the only population in the community. I wonder if that's the only one. 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 This is for a different setup. And then they double the bandwidth in the future. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll have to do another uh, another chassis to process. So I have to pre filter uh, process the uh, uh, request to find the We have four to twelve at the end of the field track, but then we do two times four to bring it down to the field. And too much as they may have to twelve gigahertz in hand. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so yeah, why yeah. are you bringing it over coax though? Why don't you send it over fiber? We don't have that yet. I'm yeah. oh, sorry. No, I'm no, not no. supposed to ask. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. Okay. Yeah, oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. I think the answer is from the comments of the question is yeah, what he's asking is can you adapt? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you adapt this design? And uh, I think the answer is yeah. yes. Of course. Um I, it, but it's not it's not switch programmable. You can't have one piece of hardware that, oh, no, no. that you throw a few jumpers on them all because you have to change the right. But, but all the parts, part, all the part, some of the parts I can reuse, but all the parts will have to be used. I'll have to scope out. Oh, no, no, no. no, no. But, but that works because there's different hardware. That's your and, 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 and you you basically throw a switch to choose whether you want to process the port weight or five to nine. Right. And I'm going to our first one. Yeah. But, but yes, I, I, I mean, I, I think it's a, a reasonable point to ask can this be made in more yes. modular? Of course. Yes, yes. It's a different part. Okay. Yeah, I should stop, but we will have a question. Yeah. Sure. Basically, I think it's wrong in line that we want to maximize the ability. We could design units that where components can accept. Like I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. But keep in mind, there's a ton of octaves between these two find. So it's hard to find a uh, bar which are uh, where the mixers have good isolation of ports. It, it's not really hard. No, not hard. Sometimes it's possible to find actually. Yeah. 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 You, I spent a lot of time even get, from getting these to get me the isolation I wanted because I was going for a hard requirement of 25 years. I would, I think so. I think that should be possible. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So those are all spec out of 30 gigahertz. So that should work. Uh, but I would have to replace some of the parts, not all of them, but some of the parts are not. Yeah, so, 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 the yep. chair, I do have to bring yep. your attention yep. that you are halfway through. Yep, yep, I'm not. Okay, okay, Manuel, sorry, sorry, you can ask. <laughs> so, we are going to talk about, uh, sorry, we can talk about conversation, we're going to talk about, of course. Some of the things we fix in the core that we heritage, and then uh, talk about uh, which of the part we can we think we have one more school. Yes, yeah. don't you have to modify the code 12 to 1 to 9 if I'm over? We do. Uh, I, 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 I thought I saw you. Okay, so so I'm, I'm going to not, not to my knowledge. <laughs> No, but, but then then a question that, that we could raise with uh, other people. I mean, I, I guess we have a new figure here. Yeah. Oh, we're going to get the other two receivers. The other two receivers are not tonight. Uh, uh, actually, I'm sorry, I don't know. Let's share it. I mean, I think we can raise this as a point, it's fine, but I would rather keep this session on intellectually. You know, same thing as well, then we made a big mistake and it's <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, because, I, because I believe that there has been interaction on, yeah. In fact, we're using 
Gopal's new receiver, okay? Yeah. And, and we're going to be able to interact with Gopal on the higher output of that receiver. And there is high CD, right? And I don't know where you get the one behind from. Somebody that very that much. Was right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's not put money. Sorry. No, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So, thank you. Thank you, Ganesh. Sorry to be a little bit forward. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Ganesh. Okay, Sorry. now, uh, just to uh, depend a little bit on what we did in the in FPGA, actually. Uh, well, uh, first, at, at the point that we were given this FPGA, uh, we didn't used to have the, the reception block working. We didn't uh, have the channels aligned. So the, the, the first thing we did to make sure that we could have the, the signals from the ADC into the FPJ was to fix the, the ADC channels. And well, basically the, what, what we did was uh, increase the robustness of the, the system, the, the algorithm that we have inside the FPJ. This uh, was due to, uh, for, for the alignment, you need a PRBS. This PR, PRBS is provided by the ADCs. And you have to create a PRBS inside of the, the FPJ to actually compare the two and align the, each channel on one ADC. We have four channels to go because we have only four bits on, on, on each ADC. So what we did was uh, inside this state machine, we have we had only four um, yes, four, four works that we could look for inside the PRBS. So we expanded that uh, the table. So we can actually uh, take different uh, measurements between the, the different uh, lengths. Yes, between the different lengths, but uh, between the different uh, lengths between each bit. So this uh, improved the robustness inside the, this, uh, this state machine, and then we could align uh, the channels on each ADC. Uh, well, this is basically the top block. This is the uh, uh, the, the hierarchy that we have inside the FPGA in this block, in this particular block, actually there are this many blocks, and this is uh, the, the, the one that we have to fix the alignment. Uh, well, uh, going on to uh, how, how we did to run the tests, well, actually, we connected tosos in each. Uh, input of the, F the AEC board, and we uh, turn on the, the FPGA and, uh, well, actually tell it the pipelines to align. Uh, and if, if we are not aligned, we get this. You can see sort of, sort of side-ish wave at the channel, channel A, in this case. Uh, this is representative that we have, uh, in this case, in modulation with a, with, a, with a wave or with a sine wave. But again, in this case, the channels are not lined, then therefore we have this sort of modulated waveform between the PRBS and the uh, and the tone source that we have in the system. Uh, well, after alignment again, we have this uh, really nice, I should say, uh, sine waves inside the FPGA, uh, and well, the requantized the requantized version of of these uh, sine waves that again, uh, well. This is a two bit quantization. And the, these uh, sine waves actually, four, four levels are not that really good, but it's the best we can, we can do. So it's what we can. Uh, well, the, the important thing what brings me here is the complexity inside the EMG. This is uh, what we have maybe to discuss a little bit because we need to uh, set an FPGA that we are going to use. and well, uh, this is this is mainly because we are going to use research. And the, the, the FPGAs that they are in the market right now, they do have many resources, but not that much uh, if, if we need to implement so many uh, processing sales. Now, uh, we are going to implement channelization. We are going to implement requantization. 
And we are going to do a maybe slow and brief implementation after the processing, after the channelization. And we have to do um, the RMS calculation, the calculations for the uh, PDC block, the AGC uh, system. Uh, if, if that's the case, this is the area. If there are two blocks more there. Uh, this is the area inside the FPGA. You can tell that almost everything is going to be built up. Now, the point, the, the important point here is that, again, for the polyphase filter bank, we are going to need DSP slices. DSP, DSP slices are uh, blocks that performs the mathematical, uh, mathematical Operation. operations. Thank you, Ronjay. Uh, these are multiplications and uh, others. And we can basically put a summation and, uh, and a multiplication inside one DSP slice. The problem is that these DSP slices are in colors in the FJ, it is projected, uh, are in colors. Now, you have, for example, 9,000 DSP slices inside the FPGA. So you might guess that, well, there are going to be some here, there are going to be some here, there, 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 and there. The point is, we are running this, these are the transceivers, this is the, these are the ADC bytes. These below here are transceivers with symptotic, and we have the cost that comes from the, from the byte at 250 megahertz. This is quite a fast clock for an FPGA, and even though we are using the mid, the, the speed rate M2, which is low power, mid, uh, mid medium, um, speed. Uh, this is the 250 megahertz is not really good for an FPGA. We have early <laughs> working uh, with, with that frequency. We can increase it more. Uh, that brings me to my next uh, slide, which has to do with the Pmax factor. And this basically uh, tell us the, the amount of DSP that we are going to get inside it. You can guess that there, there are two more, uh, uh, two more parameters. We have tasks and the number of channels. Let's focus first on the number of tasks for the polyphase filter bank. The polyphase filter bank that we're going to need, it, it's said to be to have 128 uh, channels. So that means around uh, 1,020, uh, 1,020, 1, 280 um, coefficients. So uh, there are going to be a lot of, of tasks inside the FPGA. The point is that if we increase the number of channels, the, of tasks, sorry, for, for example, four tasks, eight tasks, or 16 tasks, the amount of DSP slices we get, that, that we get for each polyphase to the bank, it's quite high. And if we have to get enough suppression on the polyphase to the bank, Maybe we'd have to go for 16 tasks, which, well, when, I don't know if you can see here, but this column is the multiplier column, and this column is the other column. This was uh, from a paper by Damian and Jonathan and others. And uh, we can see that we have roughly 7,000 DSPs, uh, 7,000 multipliers, and around uh, 9,000 uh, others. Now, I have told you that we can combine others and multiplies inside one DSP slice, but uh, you can see that we have some increase uh, in, in others that because we have to well, connect the, the, the DFT, the, the, the polyphase filter, and, and well, that, that gives us some more other, just a 30% uh, more. Now, in, in this point, uh, we we have some rough number of 9,000 DSPs just for the polyphase filter. But we have to do software reprocessation and we have to do reconversation and maybe some other processing inside the FPGA. So maybe we, one FPGA, the one that we are working right now, has only 9,024 DSP slices. So we only could do just a new section, for example. Unless we implement some of these operations in the fabric of the FPGA. If we would have to do this, maybe we have we, we run out of space inside the FPGA. So this trade-off between if we have to implement the 
the poly phase spent to bank with DSPs only, or we might get to implement some other uh, processing inside the FPGA using the public blockchain. And there is another factor. This is like five minutes. Thank you. Uh, there is another factor, that, another important factor, that is the demand part, because here you, you can see that if we reduce the max factor to 32, well, it's great actually because we decrease the number of DSPs in the FPG. But there's a problem with timing because, as I told you later uh, before, uh, we have DSPs here, 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 here. And to get a clock of 250 megahertz from here to here, it's a long run from here to there. And we have to we have to get the, that 250 clock to so these people will be there. And these operations take a long time. And well, you, you can see the timing the problem here. We if we go back to 32 uh, channel to, to the Emax part of 32, the FPGA clock has to increase to 512 megahertz. That's a lot for an FPGA to meet time requirements. And well, that is the point that brings me to what FPGA should be used. Should, should it be the VU 37P? Uh, that, well, yes, we have enough uh, DSP slides, and uh, as I told you, 9,024. Uh, we could use the VU 11P that has some more, or we can use, use the VU 13P that has 12,000 uh, DSP slides. Now, the point in, in, in this is also maybe we will need some other transceivers. We have to implement more. Um, I don't know. We, we have to implement CMA 100 gigabit interfaces, uh, for example, four, five, six, I don't know how many. So these transceivers, uh, actually, right now we are using 48 transceivers, 48. 48 transceivers. So we have 48 out of 96. And that includes 200 speed, uh, 200. Uh, um, Speed interfaces and four pipelines for each ADC. So, if we have to increase the number of ADCs and the 100 gigabit interfaces, this will have to increase it as well. Now, the point here is also the price that we have to pay for each FPGA. Now, these were in DGK, these, these prices were in DGK, it's 9,000 for the BU 37P, 6,000 for the BU 11, and 81,000 for the BU 13B. Uh, and well, this is what we shall discuss uh, if, if we have to meet these requirements. And well, I think in, in the future, if we have to implement some other functionalities inside this particular. Um, sorry? Yeah. Go ahead, keep going. Sure? Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, um, and well, just to finish this. Uh, we have implemented as well, uh, as Emilia told us uh, this morning, the um, storage system, which will be in a separate uh, FPGA. It's the same FPGA, this is a VU, uh, VCU 128. And this will get the data from uh, the data that we are processing now. This, for example, the, the pipeline data that Tons also said we have. Uh, and we will, try to, we will try to send them to this. Uh, uh, this uh, other FPGA and we'll get the packets, we will um, packetize them to send to, to a PC and we could actually see what is inside in, in, in those packets. So we can compare if the data that we are sending is the same if we are receiving. So we can sort of clarify if we are okay to send these packets to a recorder, for example. And well, this is the the sort of diagram that we have for the, the, the recorder on the other FPGA. It has, well, a receiver, 100 gigabit receiver. It has block RAMs for uh, recording packages, and it also has uh, the, the one gigabit Ethernet device that will bring the packets down to the PC. This is uh, a simulation that we have run for this storage. And the verification buoy that we are developing. Sorry, Jono, uh, we are on time, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so again, I, I uh, the boundless enthusiasm and 
and uh, and the Memsar content is, is really a testimony to this. this incredible team. Uh, let's take uh, one, maybe two questions. Uh, for my thank you. Uh, Rima. I don't know, nothing about all so a couple of questions. So first of all, of internalization, we, we have this stuff to prove that our is the top. We have this, this stuff to prove that our is the lead. Uh, and, uh, you know, ultimately, the you know, how they and, and uh, yeah, they didn't need to look that important before they put it in. But obviously, you have to talk about it. But they said, you know, a few minutes is fine. You don't have to go really, really fine. Yeah. So yeah. you can actually. I, yeah. Um, I, I, if you don't mind, I'll stress how long. There, 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 there were a number of dimensions to this analysis recommended by Adam. And, and really, all I reported was what Adam said. No, I mean, so it, they made a good about the of the other guys. They made no yes. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I think it's worthwhile. So, um, well, the main thing about standard, you, you, I think you really want that in class and all no, no. so, yes. the yeah. of that. Yeah, the eight one Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I where where were now? Where where were now? Where were now presented is relevant though is that it does bring up another channel in the five. The utilization. It's it's more about the demon center. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> okay. What which sense is banding? Not so it was yes. Oh, yeah. I can't even change. I don't see it. So, so it doesn't help that much to say maybe you learn 64 channels, maybe you can actually. Okay. okay. It would help if you're constrained by the fact by the type of SDG we get to use. Otherwise, it doesn't really help. Uh, yeah, well, one more question. Right? And it's such fascinating material. I'm, I'm, I'm breaking my pledge to run this session on time. Dan is bringing me to We are going to go, you know. 10, 22, 22. It's one hour speech. One, one more question. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. 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 64 gigabits per second on each channel. So we have 64 gigabits per second on each CMAC. So we have 128 gigabytes per second to send uh, to everyone. Um, yeah, and in March 6th, and uh, oh, uh, for, 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 for the currently I, 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 I understand the question better. Okay. Um, yeah, no, no, I gave uh, output from the units. Um, can you record from the scene of Duncan on line six? Yes, I, I believe the answer is yes, except that the except that the mark six doesn't run quite fast enough. So you have no, it's, no we will have a 30 second. Okay, so so each output is 64. This is the example of the mask. So, right. yeah, so, so I think it's, uh, I think the answer is no, but it's a little bit of a problem. You need to be able to do that. Uh, so, right. So, that's the one. So, the answer is that's what I was getting. Right. 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 That it probably bears a little bit of additional thought. But I'll, 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 the one type of interoperability that is not negotiable is the ability to run an obligation on this system and correlate it with the system that's equipped with RDBE and That is what I thought it was. It's an operability of a system equipped with a new back end with the old back end. Yeah, but I'm on the new type of the code. The code of Mark 6. So now we have the framing is that there's going to be a new report. Okay. Yeah, I would like to use the text to that in case. Okay, so your input mode. Um, I'm going to dare to allow one person to have a meeting and pass me. If there is one.
Otherwise, it's spent no longer. Okay. So, um, I guess I was next. Our next speaker is Dan Hope. Is that how I pronounce it? So, Dan Hope, uh, who might be the next step of the treaty, and he's going to do a presentation on, on the uh, house system. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Dan. And then I'll, uh, I'll stop you off the 12 that he works. Yeah, and we'll take a couple of questions. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, John. And thank you, everybody, for sticking around for this anchor related presentation. I'm aware that I'm standing with you doing your siesta. Um, so I'm I'm going to be presenting for the, the team at Haystack that is rewriting the OPS post processing system. Um, this is being a project that's led by John Barrett. Jeff Crew is sort of a senior advisor, and Violet and I are software developers there. Um, Great. Okay. All right. So POPs, um, if you've been doing VLBI for a while, you were probably familiar with it. It's a long history that started in the 1970s with Colin Rogers writing down the full methods of Fortran. Um, so totally rewritten in C in the 90s by Paul Monsdale and then uh, Roger Capallo and others maintained it since then. Um, the, the main engine of it is a program called Fortbit or Fortbit that it solves for the delay in the weight rate solutions to find the fringe and correlated data. Uh, and then it has a host of other tools that are used for calibration and code processing. Visualization. Uh, this being a software talk, this is one of two figures I have. So savor it. This is one of the, this is sort of the traditional fringe block that everyone with POPs probably um, is familiar with to get a so figure showing the, the result with a multi band delay and delay rate here, and a single band delay, and individual channel phase and interest information with a bunch of metadata, the parameters that you solve for right here. Um, so the current incarnation of POPs, which is version 3.6, um, the code is really monolithic. It's very difficult to inject new functions and features that people might want to add to their analyses. Um, it, it relies on a control file syntax that is quite antiquated. Um, and the file data formats are old and I think still based on sort of a tape drive uh, paradigm uh, and difficult to modify for the reasons. Um, so for the NGHT, we need to totally refactor everything, um, but we also are going to preserve the current functionality and performance and also backwards compatibility of the whole file presentation. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. So some of the top level stuff, and I'll throw into these in a couple of slides. Um, so for the limits on the, the number of channel stations and accumulation periods for time steps, um, we're, uh, we're going to solve this by using dynamic memory allocation and static containers that John has developed. Um, so there's going to be no practical limit on channel stations or accumulation periods for the next generation of HT. Uh, we're going to, we've chosen a few fiducial numbers for testing and optimization. Um, if you have any input on how many channels, stations, etc. Um, we should test for the numbers or something like 128 channels, 30 stations, or something like that. Uh, let us know if we should be really optimizing for more than that. Uh, the for the bandpass corrections, we're going to apply fully fully complex bandpass correction. The plotting software is going to be replaced with something probably mathematical, but we have strong opinions about that. Let us know too. Um, for extensibility, we're going to refactor the code into a sort of more bite-sized chunks that are modular and then allow for plugins and bindings to check code what's needed. Uh, and kind of smart ideas that have a lightning calibration mechanism for like that. Uh, and the whole the control file and all the input parameters to the to the, uh, to the analysis are going to be handled by wrappers, probably in Python, something like the complete parts of paradigm. Um, again, open to suggestions there. We want to support things that people like to use. Um, so the disk story formats now for HOPS 3 use this Mark 4 data format. Um, John has rewritten uh, the, the data storage into this what we call HOPS bi uh, binary data format that uh, is going to be used for all of our, our bulk visibility data and the outputs. Um, this has a header with uh, information about what's contained inside the file. Um, and, and John has written a bunch of streaming uh, routines that, that very quickly move us back and forth between disk and memory. So, so this is all, this has been a bit of a bottleneck in the process of rewriting the code, uh, but that started, that is something that cleaned and tested, and we can move on to starting to use the new data containers uh, with the, with the methods. Um, 
So we're assuming we're going to be getting our data from the index correlator and swimmer in format. Historically, there's been a tool called index to mark four that translates swimmer in format files into the core files that hops can use. We've replaced this with the index to hops routine. This is finished. Um, and then somebody comes up with a different correlator, we can support that with the, the different tool to, to translate the files into format. VEX, both 1.5 and 224 metadata is needs to be parsed in order to understand what you're analyzing. Um, this is going to be stored now in JSON format for, for easy to go in your lookups. Um, the output of forfeit is going to be stored in uh, also the hops format, but we know that people like to use other formats to look at the data, so we need bits for the of people. Um, and let us know what other formats might be interesting. Um, HDF5 is very popular, but you know, we're open to suggestions here. So the data structures, the in-memory data structures that Hops uses now are the C structs that are uh, you know, very tightly coupled to the format of the data on disk. Um, we're going to replace this with new structures that are very flexible and allow for accessibility. Um, for the really homogenous large format data like visibility to weights, um, that's going to use these variadic tempo classes that are defined in compile time. Um, so you might define, for example, a visibility table time frequency channel and polarization, the size of those dimensions. The number of dimensions is, is decided that compile time of the size is not, so you can always use, you know, can add another channel to what however much your data contains. Um, and then all the other metadata and uh, analysis parameters like that will be stored in the key value pairs and chase. In terms of plugins, we would really like to be able to move into a framework where if somebody comes up with a clever way they want to pre-process the data before fridge fitting, they're able to uh, take up a piece of Python code and prototype it, use a plugin to inject it into the, into the C structure, into the C routine, uh, let their code manipulate the data and proceed on to the fringe fitting. Um, so this has been tested with PyBind 11 and SWIG. Um, we're probably going to use a mixture of these two methods um, and shown that uh, you know, you can, you can do this with, uh, you know, you can inject a simple Python routine to, uh, to for example, a plus to calibration prior to French uh, And furthermore, we, have, we know we want to try to speed up the code using extensions to keep using things like that. Right now, if you profile forfeit, um, it's not the FFTs that are the, the, the most time consuming part. It's actually the complex multiplier that's used for the phase directly. Um, so this is something that really should be uh, parallelized to recognize calculations. Uh, so we've plenty of that code CL and so far that is. Um, and then the plotting. So PG plot is, is well past the end of its life. And it's probably, this is probably the most challenging step to actually installing hops on, on a laptop right now. Uh, we started to replace the plotting routine with Matplotlib. So this is sort of a crude replacement for the fringe plot of Matplotlib. Um, and then you're going to be able to extract the data and use your own plotting code as you like. So if you have suggestions for Plotting routines other than that plot, which those are very welcome. Um, we're going to we're going to retain the command line functionality of Aled and AS, Aedit and list, um, but we're also going to build a, a graphical user interface so that uh, that's those tools are a little more accessible to, to novice users and uh, doesn't have such a 20th century interactivity to it. Um, in terms of testing, so we so. We tested a lot of the data container functionality. Um, the uh, we have nightly uh, a compile and build process going that tests um, the, the ability of the code to work on some captured data and make sure the results are going to change. Often they break. I realize that some some of the modified code in the world breaks things, um, but that's done nightly to kind of keep track of our progress on uh, the main trunk of the, of the branch. Um, we're going to eventually implement Oracle tests that directly compare HOPS4 and HOPS3 with results with each other to make sure that we can maintain the benchmark and performance that, uh, that HOPS3 is known for. Uh, pull out of documentation. We've got a very mature requirements document at this point. It's a specification document that defines the, the way we interact with all these data containers uh, that is being updated as we develop the rules and functions. Um, we're going to be using date handling using the date library that's part of the C20 standard. Uh, we're trying to keep the external package dependencies to a real minimum so that people don't have problems to solve later on. Uh, so. Uh, so that's it. So, so this project, we've written a lot of code so far. There's a lot of code left to write. 
Uh, the next stage is to rewrite the sort of the basic forfeit uh, routines using the new data containers um, and, and demonstrate that the, you can still run forfeit with using methods as fast as as fast or faster as it was before, and which makes the same results. Um, the baseline plan is to reproduce the current functionality, but for the NGH2, so as many stations as you want to display. Um, and as time allows, we would love to do some more science with this. So as GPU supports it faster and add different print search algorithms, the current search algorithm is just a basic print search. So we can do something fancier like the Bayesian FCMC that allows some posterior distributions on the delay rate parameters. Uh, we would love to support spectral line via VLBI and global French printer. Um, let us know what you think is important. Uh, and we'll listen up everything. So, and email us. So, Love Thank you, Dan. Thanks. All right. So, Dan, actually, I know we're running late, but Dan, if you really did set the time uh, very, very precisely. So, I am going to allow time for questions uh, before we close. Uh, please don't stop open. Well, what's the time scale of the public uh, review? Um, so, so I think we're past uh, a significant bottleneck that was developing the foundational data systems for the program. Um, this next step of, of rewriting the port bit and refactoring it with the new code is, uh, is the point at which, when that, been, that is finished, we would like to release a, a minimal beta version for testing to the community um, end of the year. Maybe. It'll be pretty minimal. It'll just to get people familiar with the new methods, and try it on some different platforms, and make sure it works, um, and then pass that to the one package. Yeah, I, I will try my hardest to break it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the important. Actually, the major is in Well, they're not. But, but no, now they're not. <laughs> Makes great plots. <laughs> <laughs> and so. Uh, any any other questions? Uh, uh, I think you are here for the incredible to do the 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 HDF5 is not not that HDF5 maybe maybe a good point, and I think we can actually improve HDF5 results. The accurate the bank now that we do for the actual only data point is that to you Okay, so uh, that's in way of the comment, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, the question would be why don't you do that? You didn't mention the crap class of air, which is what you use. Well, we are in the class. So, uh, can I take a last question? Yeah. But if you're having colder bandwidth and more efficient, how are you going to be able to use the efficient? Do you think if you were to uncover the spectrum or the main It'll certainly have the ability to handle the new bandwidth in the new, the new station channels. Um, 
whether or not there will be a speed up to this TBD. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we think so, but I'm not sure how straightforward it will be to realize that. Okay, so I'm I'm gonna um, draw the session for a close then. Um, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> This is not exactly the last session. Um, I believe there's a fireside chat if anyone needs a fire for early career people. And uh, any early career people here are encouraged to go to the fireside chat in case you are feeling cold here in, in, um, in Britain.